welcome to the Acupuncture Outsider podcast. My name is Richard Hazel, and in the time it takes for you to commute to or from work, I hope to have shared something of interest about orthopedic acupuncture using motor points, trigger points, myofascial slings, uh, neurofunctional acupuncture, segmental treatments, anything that crosses my mind that seems to be of interest. I hope you'll enjoy it. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Acupuncture Outsider. This is Richard Hazel and I have a few things to talk about today. The first thing is an update on the hip patient that I talked about in my last um, episode. He came back in. He's very happy because he can stand now without uh, much pain um, and he's walking better. His only problem, though, is sitting on a hard chair. He still has pain right at the sit bone. Um, so he so he came in happy and um, feeling optimistic that we'd figure it out, and um, I do think that I figured it out. Um, and I talked about the deep longitudinal subsystem in that episode. Um, that's one of the flaming... Um, uh, myofascial slings or myofascial subsystems and I just wanted to give you some resources for that that you could um, I did I did send the link to a book uh, that he published it's a bunch of research um, and I'll, I'll link that into this episode but I, I also want to recommend that you look at um, Brent Brookbush Brookbush Institute he covers a lot about those slings and he makes it very accessible. Um, and then I'll just mention that, um, we just put the, the recording for our three day seminar in Sydney, Australia. That was all about the myofascial slings using the slings for assessment and understanding, um, the way the body works with, uh, you know, the way muscles work together with fascia, um, as slings. So, um, so I explained them as well in that that's on Podia. That's uh, richardhazel.podia.com you can see that you know, it's called the uh, sydney um live recording lumbopelvic hip complex and lower extremity so we cover a lot in that three days and dan does a, a day of that so he he covered a lot of the sort of um neurofunctional approach with um electric stim on nerve trunks and cool stuff like that. So there's a lot in there that's new to a lot of people, including the slings and, um, and the nerve trunks. There's a, I, yeah, I think there's a lot in there that you won't find elsewhere in the acupuncture world. You will find it elsewhere in the physical therapy world, rehab medicine, pain medicine. Um, okay. So that said, um, my patient came in and, um, I did, I knew I wanted to treat the same muscles, but, and I suspected maybe he had trigger points, but when I used my percussion massager to find anything that was still tender, um, some of it was a little bit piriformis, a little bit of the other deep rotators, the, uh, gemellus and, and obturator internus muscles. Um, but what I apparently didn't catch was the um, quadratus femoris muscle, which is a little tiny muscle, one of the deep six rotators that goes from the ischial tuberosity to the greater trochanter. And it really is, um, it's a stabilizer. It can definitely entrap the sciatic nerve. It It is a consideration for sciatica. Um, I think primarily it does horizontal abduction and and some stable stabilization it it is not included in the deep longitudinal subsystem as one of the stabilizers of the um, si joint because it doesn't have fascial connections to the sacro tuberous ligament um so i didn't catch that um i don't feel particularly bad about not catching that i think that was a really tricky one to find 
But I did find it with my percussion massager, treated it, and within uh, maybe three minutes, four minutes, um, he had no pain. And I had him sit, and I had him sit for a while on a hard chair to make sure that he felt better, and he did, and he went, he left feeling great. And I'm feeling pretty optimistic that that is all we're going to have to do. But we did, I did set him up with a, an appointment from when I'm back uh, from Amsterdam in the first week of November. Um, so I wanted to mention that, and um, I wanted to mention what we're doing in Amsterdam because there's some cool new stuff that I'm able to teach um, in Amsterdam. We're going to be talking about um, nerve entrapments that you don't typically see covered, um, like the occipital nerves that can cause um, headaches and migraine headaches, and um, we're going to talk about... Um, Oh, a, a very interesting um, uh, auriculotemporal nerve entrapment that I actually saw in my office um, a few weeks ago, one of my regular patients. And, um, and it seemed to be the most entrapped right, right behind the eye in the, in the um, there's an acupuncture point called Tai Yang sort of that Tai Young area, and I treated that with electric stim, and the pain went away, and it stayed away. I just saw her this this week for her once a month uh, maintenance, and she has no more pain there. Um, but she was getting headaches there. Um, but that's, that's a branch of the uh, trigeminal nerve. And, um, oh, and I had another patient with trigeminal neuralgia um, recently. I wasn't going to mention this, but it's a cool story. She was uh, she was sent by a patient of mine um, because she had trigeminal neuralgia, and um, what was interesting is that she had put together that it was um, more painful when she when she chewed or talked. So she knew there was a jaw component, and then she once she gave me the history, um, there appeared to be a neck component because she would press behind the ear right at the mastoid process. And if you look at anatomy charts, you'll see that there's a part of the trigeminal nerve that's that's right around the upper part of the SCM and then can go up over the ear and then there's this, uh, and then there's that um, auricular temporal uh, branch that comes up from the jaw. So um, I kind of went with that because, it, and I pressed on her SCM and we, and she seemed to have some sense that that was relevant when I would press in the back, upper back part of the SCM. So that's what I treat. I treated it almost like a TMJ. I treated with needles in the temporalis and then the masseter motor points. And then I treated her, well, I treated her, her whole neck. I mean, I did um, the extensors, anything that was tight. I, I mean, I'm not just going for pain relief. I'm going for mobility in this case. Um, cause I don't want coming back. So, um, so we worked on, we worked on lateral flexion. We worked on extension. We, you know, a lot of, a lot of different muscles, but the, the main ones that I think were relevant for her trigeminal neuralgia were, were those, um, face muscles and, and then the jaw. I mean, I should just say jaw muscles, but you know, the ones on the face and then the SCM for sure. So, I treated all those muscles and she felt good leaving. And then I heard from her friend who came in the next week that she has been without symptoms and she's very, very happy about it. Um, I, I didn't book her as a follow-up because her friend had paid for her session to get her to go. Um, her friend was like, you have to try this. And she was skeptical and she was, she didn't really think acupuncture could help. Um, but her friend said, yes, you will go see him. And here I have paid for it. So, so, um, so she came in. That's why we didn't do follow up because I didn't want to put her friend on the hook or, and if she didn't feel financially ready to, um, to book a follow up, then I wasn't going to pressure her on that. I, I assumed if the trigeminal neuralgia was better, but not a hundred percent, she would find a way to come in. But I, from what I hear, she is symptom free. So that, that's pretty cool. Um, that's one of the things we'll be talking about um, in Amsterdam um, later this month. We'll be talking about other um, relevant nerve entrapments, 
Um, we'll be doing some dry needling techniques for upper traps, levator scap, a lot of shoulder things. I'm going to be, uh, there's a whole day of shoulder and I, I'm excited about it because um, I feel like um, I'm teaching things that nobody taught me um, that I wish they had there. You know, um, we, if we rely too heavily on the acupuncture community to teach us things that there are other professions that spend more time focused on, um, then we can miss out on some things. And, and I think really learning from physical therapists has been so helpful for me, especially understanding the shoulder. So really recognizing how to assess the pecs and the lats, um, tricep, um, bicep, corcobrachialis, um, understanding better um, how scapular stabilization is happening and not just focusing on serratus anterior and upper traps um, and levator, but really um, seeing things more um, holistically, um, how the rhomboids and the serratus anterior form a sling that, um, that goes from the back to the front and looking at things more, um, I, I just say in a more detailed way, I wish somebody had really explained to me how the lats can internally rotate the humerus and cause a, like a forward head posture with the internal rotation of the shoulders that upper cross. Um, but you know, well, I know it now, but I'm teaching, I'm, that's why I'm teaching these things. That's why I'm excited about teaching things like that. And just, you know, thinking about Terry's major and how it can internally rotate the, the, sh the shoulder. And that's all relevant because if your humerus is internally rotated, you try to abduct, there can be an impingement there. Um, and, and we can often help people a lot, um, even if they have fairly poor posture, cro uh, like an upper cross syndrome, um, if a lot of that rotation is released from via the pecs and the lats and the teres major, um, you can you can really make a big improvement on someone who's having an impingement um, on abduction of their shoulder. Um, you'll also just find there are people who have pain right at that intertubercular sulcus um, on the front of the humerus where those three muscles attach. And, um, you know, you could end up assuming it was a bicep tendonitis, or you could assume that it was an anterior deltoid issue or maybe a corcobrachialis issue. But in fact, it could be pain when they're doing fle you know, flexion and they have pain there. It could actually be from uh, any of those three muscles and more likely the lats. So um, anyway, that's the kind of thing we're going to be talking about. And we'll be dry needling some latissimus dorsi stuff. Um, where I'm just, I'm really excited about this one because it's a lot of new material and, um, uh, we will be, we will be rep repeating this material in Sydney in March and that will be recorded and that will go up on Podia. So if you're feeling financially strapped and you can't make it to uh, a live course, um, this material will be ev eventually available sometime late March, I think. Um, I always recommend that people do learn things live. Um, but I also recognize that there are many people who already have great um, hand skills and maybe already do some dry needling. And these, these tips can really just be an add added you know, bonus to what you're already doing. Um, safely, you know, I just don't recommend that people who don't know these things, um, try to learn them from a video. If you haven't learned in person first, the video is awesome for reference, um, a reminder for something that you've hopefully already learned live. And I also kind of look at it as hopefully somewhat inspirational to people who aspire to do more with orthopedic acupuncture to see um, how we're treating and hopefully get you interested enough that you will invest in um, coming to a live course. Um, I realize it's 
it's not inexpensive to fly somewhere and pay for a hotel. But if you look at it as an investment, like your acupuncture education in school was, it, it pays in dividends. It pays in, you know, exponential ways when you start getting much, much better results and your patients are out recommending you to many people or, or like me, you, you have relationship with, um, pain management doctors and, um, physical therapists and, uh, you know, um, other rheumatologists and, and other people who are sending you their patients because they know what you do works and they recognize from their patients that it's a viable approach for uh, treating a lot of different kinds of pain. So, um, all right. So then the last thing I wanted to talk about, oh, I talk about the patients. Okay. Yeah. The last thing I wanted to talk about was, um, the, um, the myofascial slings that we covered in the Podia, um, course that's online now, just why it's relevant. Um, for, if you haven't heard of Andre, that's A N D R Y Vlaming V L E E M I N G. Please look into it. Look into his work. He spent his life studying the SI joint. I mean, of course, other things, but this is a passion of his because he recognizes that it's poorly understood and, and which leads to a lot of um, people who aren't getting the resolution to their pain that they should. And he recognizes that the SI joint doesn't have to be in pain to be the source of pain. So, because he looks, he's looking at the way the body works together to stabilize the SI joint. If you think about your spine coming straight down to the sacrum and then it splits, the force transmission coming straight down splits and goes to your legs. And the same thing coming back up, comes up one leg to the sacrum, the right side, the SI joint. And your body has to dynamically stabilize um, so that you, well, just so that you can move pain-free. And if that, if the stabilizers become weak, then other muscles will overwork in order to compensate. And that can be spinal erectors. It can be um, the deep rotators. It could be hip abductors. Um, it could be adductors. There's, there are many ways that your body needs to stabilize your SI joint. And so I cover, I cover those in this course. And when you understand the way the body compensates, and if you look at the, the lumbopelvic hip complex and the whole lower body as coming from um, not just from the glutes, but from the pelvis and those pelvic stabilizers and the SI joint and, and the body's need to instantaneously stabilize, then you will have a much better chance of helping people that many other people have not been able to help. Um, one of my um, regular patients who comes in for maintaining, um, to uh, basically not have migraines. Um, as long as we, uh, as long as I see him like once a month, he's fine. But he came to me after, um, um, getting the COVID booster and having, um, a month of unremittent migraine headache. And he, you know, he went to the neurological area, um, um, location that he went for his migraines and um nothing was helping so somebody sent him to me and i um i i treated him and and then he he had no more pain um i'm not gonna go into what i did but just just know that after at the end of my treatment his 
his headache began to go away and stayed away until the next time I saw him. And then we kept, I saw him once a week for a while. And then we felt comfortable going to out to like once a month. Um, anyway, he sent his niece who had excruciating hip problems for the past 14 years. And um, since she had her kid, um, she was in labor for 20 hours. And after that, she had sciatica and hip pain, and she could bear. She just had a lot of mobility issues. Um, her hips were terrible, and he sent. He paid for her visit. He paid for a few visits for her, um, and she's a hairstylist, so she stands all day. Um, anyway, um, long story short, with her deep longitudinal subsystem, um, piriformis gemellus muscles, and the obturator internus. And also worked on glute meat and glute max to get those firing better. And then I worked on TFL and glute min. And I I think the first visit I didn't do anything from the front like rec fem or so as. I did those the second visit just, just for good mobility. But she was, when I saw her for a second visit, she's ec- ecstatic. She said, my hips feel the best they felt in 15 years. I can't believe it. And she got her mobility back. And her kids, who know their mom can barely move, were shocked. They were like, Mom, how are you like bending over and picking things up? Oh, my God. They they could not believe it. She was telling me. They they were like, oh, my God. Um, They've just never seen her move the way she's able to move. And that's all from understanding the deep longitudinal subsystem and how it works. Um, So... 14 years of pain gone. And I saw her for a second visit. It was just a follow-up. I just did a lot, you know, it's a little extra. I did what I did before plus some other stuff. And I just said, let's keep the other session on the books. Um, and I'll, maybe I'll see you in a month if you want to do a follow-up. Um, and then hopefully we can push you to, um, you know, every every two months or something like that. But just keep that in the books in, in case you need it. Um, in case any issue comes back before a month, um, then just come in and it's already paid for, um, by your uncle. So anyway, that's deep longitudinal subsystem and really understanding that is game changing for so many people. Um, there's, there, there, the other slings are, are of course equally important, but that's the one that I have seen help people that nothing else was helping. That's the one that helps the hip pain patients that nothing else helps. That's the sciatica patients that nothing else is helping. Piriformis is not enough for many people with sciatica. You got to get into those, those lower rotators. Um, and of course, you know, work on the glutes and the glute medius, glute max, possibly lumbar, you know, um, I, I tend to add the lumbar after the first visit. Um, if there is a, a flare up, if there is a flare up between visits, um, if there is no flare up, I don't worry that there's um, L5S1 involved at this point. I consider it more like an overuse of those deep rotators because of some other instability in the glutes, sometimes even the hamstrings. So, um, okay. So, and that's deep gluteal syndrome. And there's another episode about that if you're interested. So, um, okay, I, I got to get going. I have a French lesson in a few minutes. But I wanted to mention all those things. The updates on the patients and the new course that's out on Podia and the Amsterdam course that's coming up at the end of this month. Um, so there's a lot of stuff. Um, if you're... If you're new and maybe you've never heard any of my episodes before, um, my Instagram is Rich Hazel, R-I-C-H-H-A-Z-E-L. And there's, there's, um, I feel like that's the one that I keep most up to date. I do post some things on Facebook. Um, but I think Instagram is like the, the best way to share information. Um, so definitely follow there if you can. And, um, richardhazel.podia.com. There's some free stuff on there. If you want to get a sense of um, my style or how I teach or what I say or any of anything. Um, 
yeah, and I guess that's it. So hopefully you have a great week and I will be uh, in touch soon. I think I will be able to record next week. If it's not on the weekend, it'll be shortly after once I land in Amsterdam. Okay, take care.